Hello, everybody. All right, we are going to do chapter 13 again. We did uh, make a video a few weeks back, um, but I'm going to redo it now, and we're going to present it on Saturday. So the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. So introduction. Um, the purpose is to identify and describe the anatomical features of the spinal cord and spinal nerves to discuss the functions of the spinal cord and spinal nerves and understand how they help maintain homeostasis in the body. And thirdly, to understand the spinal reflex arcs. So functions of the spinal cord, their functions are to process reflexes, uh, to integrate um, excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, and then conduct sensory impulses to the brain and motor impulses to effectors. So the spinal cord is protected by uh, three layers. There's the bone, which is the, the vertebrae, and you can see to orient you, there's a spinous process of the vertebrae up top, uh, transverse process. Um, well, here's the transverse foramen, or it's transverse process right here. Um, and covering the bone are connective tissue uh, known as the meninges, but we've got the uh, the pia mater, um, let's see, what else do we have? We have the dura mater uh, and the arachnoid space. So we will go through those in subsequent slides. And then finally, uh, the fluid, uh, the cerebral spinal fluid protects the spinal cord um, and the fluid fills up these, these cavities. And then you can see some uh, vasculature here, looks like arteries, uh, vertebral arteries. Uh, coming up the spinal cord. So the meninges are composed of three layers, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. And uh, this, uh, this transverse section through the spinal cord shows the outer covering is the dura. This is the most uh, durable layer. And um, these ligaments that are coming out, uh, these are... Uh, uh, denticulate ligaments. These are fiber structures that help to anchor the spinal cord in place. Um, and they're coming out of the dura. Underneath the dura uh, is a subdural space, followed, followed by the arachnoid matter, which is in the middle. The arachnoid matter is kind of spider-like. Uh, it has a lot of... Uh, um, uh, it just has a lot of different threads in it that kind of looks like a spider web a little bit. And then underneath um, is the subarachnoid space. And underneath that um, is the pia mater, which has a lot of vasculature in it. Okay, It's embedded in the matter. And so you can see uh, arteries and veins um, in the pia mater. And then underneath the pia is going to be the spinal cord. So the spinal cord begins as an extension of the medulla oblongata at the level of the foramen magnum and terminates at the level of L2. So it goes um, all the way before C1 down to L2. And you can see uh, at that position is the conus medullaris, which is the end of the spinal cord and the beginning of the cauda equina, um, which are these nerves that uh, pass down to the coccyx. So the conus medullarius is the terminal end of the spinal cord, which typically occurs at L1. Um, there's a syndrome called conus medullaris syndrome, uh, results when there's compression damage to the spinal cord from T12 to L2. So the Cauda equina is a continuation of these nerve roots in the lumbar and sacral regions. And these nerves send and receive messages to and from the lower limbs and pelvic organs. Cauda equina syndrome occurs when there is dysfunction of multiple lumbar and sacral nerve roots of the cauda equina. And then finally, the phylum uh, terminale is a fibrous band that connects the conus medullaris to the posterior body of the coccyx. So the phylum terminale uh, is, is what anchors the, uh, the nerves to the coccyx.
And from this uh, drawing, we can also see uh, a number of uh, plexuses, like the cervical plexus, followed by the brachial plexus. Uh, then the thoracic nerves come off. There's no, th there's no plexus in the thoracic region. And then we pick up with the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus and a few coccygeal nerves. So let's look at the anatomy of the spinal cord. So we can see the uh, brown, which is the gray matter, and then the kind of green, which is the white matter. Um, in the, the uh, posterior with this uh, transverse section, we see the posterior median sulcus. In the anterior, we see the median anterior fissure. <clears throat> In the middle is a central canal where uh, cerebral spinal fluid runs. And uh, then if we look at the gray matter, we've got uh, a posterior gray horn and an anterior gray horn uh, bilaterally. In the middle, there's a, a what's called the gray commissure. Uh, and the gray commissure is a thin strip of gray matter that surrounds the central canal. Um, and it connects the two uh, horns together. Uh, the white matter, there are a number of tracks. There's the anterior white column. There is the posterior white column. There is the lateral white columns. Okay, so let's take a deeper look, this time at, at a little cartoon here. So we've got our, um, our anterior white columns, our posterior white columns, uh, ventral, lateral white columns, and this is all the white matter, the gray matter, got our posterior gray horns here, anterior gray horns, uh, and now we could insert in the uh, uh, neurons. So nerve impulses um, come up and there's a little uh, cell body, a little ganglia here that is entering uh, the uh, posterior horn. And uh, this is gonna be a sensory neuron. It synapses in the gray matter uh, on an interneuron. And then uh, that synapses onto a motor neuron, which then travels down to its effector. Uh, alternately, there's a, an autonomic motor neuron also uh, at that space. It's not being activated, but it, it, it could be. And so these lead the nerve impulses um, back to uh, their effectors. We can orient ourselves with the median fissure in the anterior and the median sulcus in the posterior. When you're looking at the horns, uh, the posterior horn connects to the uh, posterior root of the spinal nerve, um, and then not far is the uh, uh, dorsal root ganglion. The spinal nerve is what exits here. Here is the anterior root. So sensory information travels in the posterior root. It synapses and then uh, throws some more nerves through the anterior root, and this travel in the same spinal nerves. Okay, sensory and motor processing. The internal anatomy of the spinal cord allows sensory and motor information to be processed in an organized way, pretty much simultaneously. So um, if we concentrate on the right side here, we've got the skin with a pin prick, um, pain receptors, maybe stretch receptors are activated in the spinal nerve afferents. The afferent signal is, uh, is, is sent toward the uh, dorsal root. Uh, it synapses with an interneuron and then its effector, a motor neuron, back to the muscle. And this is going to be uh, a way that reflexes occur without being processed uh, by the brain. So we've got a number of numbers here. Let's see if we can follow them, but sensory receptors in the skin, that's going to be the tip-off 
for the afferent pathway to get those action potentials going. They then um, enter the posterior gray horn where they synapse with uh, an uh, internal neuron, but also with um, a sensory neuron, this ascending that is going up to the brain to be processed. So it looks like we have different paths of information. We've got a reflex, which um, is going to activate a motor neuron, possibly to get us out of the way of this, whatever is, is causing pain or heat or something. Uh, and the information is also sent up to the brain to be processed. And um, descending modulation uh, by way of motor neurons can then be activated to modulate further this uh, synaptic point. So there are ways of, of modifying reflexes with, with descending input. And these um, autonomic motor neurons that may be activated lead to uh, organs like the heart, bladder, pancreas, glands, smooth muscles. So if we take the spinal cord segments and put them side by side, uh, they, they do differ by size and a little bit of geometry, but the cervical uh, cord segments are relatively large. Uh, there's a large amount of white matter. Um, and uh, let's see, the anterior horn is a little bigger than the posterior horn. When you get to the thoracic, uh, a little smaller diameter. Um, and in the lumbar, uh, it's nearly circle, circular. So very large anterior and posterior gray horns in the lumbar region. Uh, the sacral is a little bit smaller, um, but still relatively large amounts of gray matter, at least compared to cervical. And coccygeal uh, resembles the sacral, but it's a little bit smaller. All right, spinal nerves. So they connect to the central nervous system to sensory receptors, muscles, and glands, and are part of the peripheral nervous system. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Uh, there's anterior and posterior roots attached to the spinal nerve to a segment of the spinal cord. And the spinal nerves are uh, wrapped in protective coating. Um, first of all, each axon uh, is myelinated most of the time. And then around this myelin uh, is a protective membrane called the endoneurium. This is around each axon. And then there are fascicles of uh, of axons that um, are covered by the perineurium, and then fascicles come together to form the actual nerve fiber, where you can now see blood vessels coming up, and this is covered by the epineurium. So we've got three layers around these nerves, the endoneurium, around the axons, the perineurium, around the fascicles, and the epineurium around the entire nerve. And there are their blood vessels that, uh, that, that are moving longitudinally. So branches of the spinal nerve. So shortly after passing through its intervertebral foramen, the spinal nerve divides into several branches known as rami. And so here we are, a uh, superior anterior view looking um, at, uh, it looks like thoracic vertebrae, um, but we've got, we've got just branches. We've got rami communicantes um, coming out of the roots. And this is gonna become more clear when we look at the different plexes. But here's a posterior ramus an anterior ramus, a meningeal branch. So the spinal nerves um, also carry somatic sensory nerve impulses to the brain from the skin. And so there are four different 
uh, regions that are represented by the skin. There's the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. And so uh, each cranial um, nerve, like C2, C3, C4, C5, um, will innervate a certain stretch of skin. And um, this, this can manifest itself as a rash if there is a, uh, a virus hanging out in one of the dorsal root ganglions. Um, but there are a number of uh, conditions like uh, shingles. It's very painful, but it tends to follow a dermatome because the shingles uh, herpes zoster virus likes to hang out in the root ganglion. And so you will get pain along a certain dermatome based on your own pathology for shingles. There's also uh, disc herniations from advanced age or trauma, which um, can impinge on the spinal nerves and can cause problems. So let's take a the, look at the nerve plexus and the body area served. And so we take a posterior view. We've got the cervical nerves, C1 through C8. This is going to be your uh, cervical and uh, brachial plexus. Then we've got the thoracic nerves, T1 through T12. Lumbar nerves, L1 through L5. Sacral nerves, S1 through S5. And coccygeal. So here we can see the cauda equina, conus medullaris. Okay, so let's start with the cervical plexus. Cervical plexus is split up into roots and nerves. And so there are five roots um, that, uh, that branch off to the lesser occipital, the greater auricle, transverse cervical, superior root of the ansa cervicalis, inferior root of the ansa cervicalis, and supraclavicular as well as phrenic. So the ansa cervicalis is a neural loop in the back uh, in the neck formed by connecting the superior root from the spinal nerves, C1 and C2, and the inferior root from the descending, C2s and C3s. And it has various anatomical variations and can be important in acknowledging specific operations of the neck region. Okay, so we look at uh, the nerve, it's sort of the lesser occipital, the origin is C2. Um, it distributes in the skin and the scalp posterior and superior to the ear. The greater auricle, uh, it, that's over the ear. Uh, transverse cervical, uh, skin over anterior and lateral aspects of the neck. And supraclavicular, skin over superior portion of the chest and shoulder. Then there are deep, uh, largely motor branches which is like the ansa cervicalis, which divides the superior and inferior roots. The superior root uh, is C1, that's infrahyoid and geniohyoid muscles of the neck. There's the inferior root, C2 and C3, which are infrahyoid muscles of the neck. And then uh, down from the ansa cervicalis, we've got the phrenic, which uh, supplies the diaphragm and segmental branches which are prevertebral muscles of the neck, pretty deep, like uh, levator scapulae and middle scaling. So let's go on to the brachial plexus. This is probably the most complex plexus we have. Um, this provides almost the entire nerve supply to the shoulders and the upper limbs. And these are split into roots, trunks, divisions, anterior and posterior, cords and branches. And there is a little bit of a mnemonic, like risk takers don't cautiously behave. Roots, trunks, divisions, cords, branches. You can try that if you wish. So um, from C4, we get C5. We get the superior, middle, and inferior trunks, lateral, posterior, and medial cords. Uh, this goes to... Uh, a number of nerves, including, including the radial, the medial, ulnar. Let 
Now the brachial plexus uh, can get damaged and um, palsy can result. This is weakness or paralysis in parts of the arm. Uh, this, this can happen during childbirth. Uh, it's, it's not as common these days, but um, the most common type of brachial pal uh, palsy is called Herb's palsy. And you can see a, a few different examples. We've got wrist drop, um, median nerve palsy, uh, Herb Duchenne palsy uh, with his hand kind of uh, cupped, then ulnar nerve palsy which with palsy with the two smaller fingers uh, tucked in, and then winging of the, the scapula, uh, this muscle that attaches the scapula to the spine is, is weakened and uh, tends to wing out. All right, so get back into the brachial plexus. We've got the dorsal scapula nerve, nerve to the subclavius, super uh, scapular nerve, thoracic, pectoral, cutaneous, um, auxiliary, musculocutaneous, radian, ulnar, median, all the major nerves that pass down the arm. Okay, I'm um, not sure what all I'm going to do with this this table. Let's just let's just skip it. We might come back to it. Okay, so the lumbar plexus, a little bit more simple than the uh, the brachial plexus, but it's got roots, anterior and posterior divisions. The uh, divisions are the iliohypogastric, the ilioinguinal, uh, genetofemoral, lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, the femoral and the obturator. So the lumbar plexus supplies, uh, the plexus supplies nerves like the sciatic, um, which is a, a major nerve that, that travels down the leg. Uh, the obturator nerve is another big one. Um, and we've talked about uh, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, femoral and lateral cutaneous. Now we've got uh, anacoxygeal and femoral nerve. So with the lumbar plexus, at L1, um, muscles of the anterior lateral abdominal wall, skin of the inferior abdomen and buttocks. Uh, ilioinguinal is also L1, muscles of the anterior lateral abdominal wall. Skin of the superior and medial aspect of the thigh, root of the penis, and scrotum in male, and labia majora, and mons pubis in female. Geneta femoral, at the level of L1 and L2, is the cremaster muscle. Skin over the middle anterior surface of the thigh, scrotum in the male, and labia majora in female. Then there's the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, that's L2 and L3. That covers the skin over the lateral, anterior, and posterior aspects of the thigh. The femoral nerve is the largest nerve arising from the lumbar plexus uh, that's distributed to flexor muscles of the hip, extensor muscles of the knee, skin over the anterior and medial aspects of the thigh, and medial side of the leg. And then finally, the obturator, uh, which is L2 to L4, which is an adductor muscle at the hip joint, as well as skin over the medial aspect of the thigh. Okay, the sacral plexus, these have roots, anterior divisions, and posterior divisions. And we've got nerves like the superior gluteal, inferior gluteal, nerve to the piriformis, the tibial nerve, the common fibular nerve, and that's what makes up the large sciatic. There's a nerve to the quadratus femoris and inferior gemellus, the nerve to the obturator internus and superior gemellus, uh, the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, perforating cutaneous, and pudental. So the pudental nerve is the main nerve of the perineum. It carries sensation from the external genitalia as, of both sexes and the skin around the anus and perineum as well as the motor supply to various pelvic muscles, including the male or female 
external urethral sphincter and the external anal sphincter. So if we uh, follow this sciatic, um, it branches into the tibial and common fibular nerve, um, branches into the deep fibular, superficial fibular, uh, and the median and latter plantar nerves. Okay, so the sacral plexus uh, is going to innervate your glutes, um, the superior gluteal nerve, does the gluteus minimus medius, uh, the inferior gluteal comes out of L5 to S2, does the gluteus maximus, the nerve to the piriformis is S1 and S2, that's a piriformis muscle, nerve to the quadratus femoris, that's L4 to L5 and S1, and nerve to the obturator internus, um, perforating cutaneous. Let's go down to the pudental, that's S2 to S4. And finally, the sciatic, L4 to S3. It's a very long section. Continuing on with the tibial nerve, uh, it provides the gastrocnemius, the soleus, the plantaris, popliteus, tibialis posterior, flexum digitorum longus, flexor helicus longus, and uh, the medial plantar, which uh, is an abductor of the halicus, um, as well as the lateral plantar. Aside from the tibial nerve, there's a common fibular, which is also uh, L4 to S2. This divides into a superficial and deep fibular. So the superficial um, fibularis longus and fibularis brevis, uh, muscles, and there's skin over the distal third of the anterior aspects of the leg and the dorsum of the foot. The deep fibular uh, goes into the tibialis anterior, extensor halicus longus, fibularis tertius, and extensor digitorum longus and extensor digitorum brevis muscles. Okay, let's take a look at reflexes. So reflex arc is very fast, it's involuntary, it's unplanned, and it's in response to a particular stimulus. So the reflexes help us to maintain homeostasis. And the gray matter of the spinal cord serves as an integrating center for the reflex. So what we have is an afferent pathway in blue. We've got the integumentary system with the TAC in it, um, uh, activating pain receptors, which are going to activate an action potential uh, into the posterior horn, um, synapse onto the interneuron, and then activate a motor neuron, which is the effector. And uh, this might be a withdrawal reflex. So you step on a pin, and then you withdraw your foot. So in order to maintain homeostasis, the spinal cord must propagate nerve impulses and integrate information. But uh, how does it do this? So white matter track tracks conduct nerve impulses to and from the brain, and gray matter receives and integrates incoming and outgoing information to perform spinal reflexes. And so we've got a number of, of white tracks here, like the posterior column, the spinal cerebellar track, um, spinothalamic track, uh, tect spinal track, medial reticular spinal track, anterior cortical spinal track, a number of, of white matter tracks. And so the white matter is, this is going to be the axons of the nerves that are going uh, to and from the brain. A couple of vocabulary words which are noteworthy, but unilateral is on one side, bilateral is on both sides. Ipsilateral is when you're comparing two body parts and those two are on the same side. Contralateral would be when those two body parts that you are comparing are on different sides of the body. Uh, you have different reflexes. Monosynaptic reflux has a single synapse between the afferent and efferent neurons. You can see that here. We've got our stimulus, our sensory afferents, and then our uh, motor efferents and the response. It's a single, um, single synapse. Polysynaptic, uh, there are two or more synapses occurring uh, in this, this gray matter region, this integration center of the spinal cord. It could be to activate... Um, like a withdrawal, uh, 
and um, to another target organ for a response. There's also uh, reciprocal innervation. And um, what this means is you've got an efferent uh, sensory neuron that comes into the integration center. There are a number of different interneurons it can synapse to, um, but one interneuron can be inhibitory, so you could uh, inhibit antagonistic muscles but activate your agonistic muscles, um, depending on what it is the reflex is going to call for. All right, let's start with the stretch reflex. So this causes contraction of the muscle that has been stretched, and usually a patellar hammer is used to, uh, to strike the patellar tendon. This simulates stretching of your thigh muscles. Okay, so it sends an afferent up to the spinal cord, uh, and it integrates um, with uh, a couple muscle groups. It inhibits the muscle groups in the antagonistic uh, compartment, but activates muscle groups uh, in the agonist compartment, which is going to cause a kicking motion, which is going to shorten the muscle, the muscle that has been uh, stretched apparently by this uh, patellar hammer is going to shorten. And so it's a stretch reflex that it simulates st overstretching of your, of your leg muscles. Okay, then we have a, a tendon reflex, which is a little bit of the opposite, but it causes relaxation of the muscles attached to the stimulated tendon. And so in this case, the sensory information is going to be integrated um, and there's going to be uh, an inhibitory and an, an uh, act activation interneuron, but this time the antagonistic muscles are going to contract and the agonistic muscles are going to relax. And so the stretch reflex operates as a feedback mechanism to control muscle length by causing muscle contraction. And the tendon reflex operates the negative feedback to control, control muscle tension. And so these have two different uh, aims. Um, and so instead of kicking the tendon reflex, you're going to tuck your leg in. So you're actually going to stretch this, this muscle. Okay, we have the flexor withdrawal reflex. Um, this causes withdrawal of a limb to avoid injury or pain. Uh, the reflex rapidly coordinates the contractions of all the flexor muscles and relaxations of the extensors in that limb, causing a sudden withdrawal from the potentially damaging stimulus, like a tick or a tack that you've stuck your foot onto. The spinal reflexes are often monosynaptic and are mediated by a simple reflex arc. So you step on a tack, afferents go to the spinal cord, um, there's an interneuron that activates um, a muscle group uh, on the contralateral side, which allows you to shift your weight and get off of the tick or tack. Okay, crossed extensor reflex. This is very important in walking and maintaining balance. But the crossed extensor reflex is a contralateral reflex that allows the body to compensate on one side for a stimulus on the other. So here we have our number one, our tepping, stepping on our tack, our afferents going up into through the dorsal root ganglion, into the dorsal root, um, synapsing with a number of interneurons, some of them which cross, uh, cross the hemispheres and activate muscle groups on the contralateral side, as well as some muscle groups uh, on the ipsilateral side, just in different compartments. And the goal in this case is to walk and to balance and to activate one leg at a time, to inhibit one leg at a time, uh, so that you get walking motion. All right, disorder. So traumatic injuries like monoplegia, paraplegia, hemiplegia and quadriplegia uh, can result from damage to the spinal cord. Um, and it depends on the degree of the spinal cord section or the degree of compression, but um, sometimes uh, the intervertebral discs can herniate and compress the spinal cord. This can lead to problems. There are degenerative diseases 
like um, when the uh, intervertebral disc wears down and you've got kind of bone on bone uh, compression and irritation of the spinal nerves that way. Um, another condition uh, with a virus called shingles, this virus hangs out in your dorsal root ganglion and it can lead to a number of different pathologies um, downstream. And then polio, uh, the disease of the past, um, leads to a decrease in motor neurons. And so you see all these, these red dots without lines. These are motor neurons that have died. Okay. Now, whatever effector they had, that effector is going to atrophy. So if it's a muscle group, it's going to atrophy because it's not being activated. So you lose the uh, motor neurons, you will lose the muscle as well. Okay, that is uh, this chapter. I will see you in a few for the next chapter.